everyone, it is Nicole with Dr. Spraxman's Personal Injury Show. I'm here with my partner Jean-Paul Anderson and we have the pleasure of you interviewing Ala Yassine with Dordic Law Corporation. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. So, so excited. Yeah, we're super excited that yeah. you're here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to go through a set of questions here and we're going to be uh, basically uh, Al is going to be answering some of these questions. Uh, that way you guys get the education that you guys are looking for and that way you guys know what to expect if things go wrong in a personal injury case or how to hire a trial lawyer uh, during a personal injury. Anyhow. <laughs> accident. <laughs> personal injury accident, out, but, okay. yes. All right, so um, some of, I, I guess, the number one question is, what What would you say, out of the years of experience that you've had, what are like the most, what is the most impactful case that you've tried so far? Well, you know, it's hard to say because every case is important, you know, because every person that trusts us with their lives, you know, it's a, it's a privilege to do that. And so every case kind of sticks out. But I think the most impactful case perhaps I've been on or tried probably you know there's varying degrees of challenges in every case but you know I've had cases where uh, defense lawyers have tried to throw out our cases just by filing motions for summary judgment and claiming that you have no case it's like a trial on paper mm. and I had this particular ATV case uh, up in Santa Barbara a rollover accident that um, involved an older woman she was out there with her husband they were doing an ATV tour and some tour guide really didn't instruct them on how to ride properly and it was their first time. She's going up the steep incline, the ATV rolls back and it falls on her and she dies about a week later. Ooh, now, ouch. in those types of cases, you sign a release form basically waiving any and all lawsuits claim. So Correct. that was a hard fought motion. They fought a motion to get off on the release. We, we beat it because we showed gross negligence and now we're still in litigation. So that's an impactful result for me to want to get justice for the surviving husband yeah. though we're not at trial yet but things like that you know really stand out in my mind because normally those cases do get thrown out have uh. you have you ever had a case where you're just like did i pick the right career to to hear stories and deal with stuff like that every <laughs> every day and these some are tragic most of them are tragic and it's like yeah. how do you how do you deal with that every day mentally like how do, is there a way to prep yourself before something like that or do you need extra therapy or so, i don't Working even know out. yeah i mean that's a good point so yeah. that's a great question but yes i mean there's there's so much that goes into it that, yeah, I definitely think all the time, did I pick the right career, you know? Mm -hmm. Sometimes I look at my, these doctors that we work with and think to myself, maybe I should have been a doctor, maybe I should have done this. But ultimately I come back and, and I'm glad that I'm able to be in this position to help people. Yes. Um, but a way to deal with it is yes, working out for me is one of my favorite things I like to do. It helps me mentally, it helps me kind of, you know, um, calm down, but also organize my thoughts. Mm -hmm. So that okay. helps. Being with my family helps to get away from it. But you know, when you get into the the thick of it, you really got to control your emotions yeah. because sometimes in trial, like I've shed tears when I've watched Gary Dordick do a closing, you know, on a trial that I've been involved in, and it's just so emotional when you have like a, a child who died in an accident and their parent is up there testifying, crying. It's, it's, it's that's hard. hard, especially you're a parent too. Yeah, like, when you're a parent, just... it just strikes a chord with you, but you learn to kind of manage and you learn to kind of, you know, do, th do what you need to do to be able to just kind of put those emotions aside. But privately speaking, when I'm in the office and I'm like evaluating a case and looking at the facts and stuff, and I see something that's really horrific, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a human being and I have emotions yeah. and, yeah. you know. I feel like no. I would have the worst paranoia with everything. <laughs> right. I, oh, I don't think I could but ever it's do it. natural. Look, it's no. natural because you need to be able to have that human to side. Yes. Because that's what jurors want to see. Right. If you're just a robot attorney up there, they're going to see right through you and say, this person has no credibility. In the courtroom, credibility is the only currency you have. Credibility is the only currency you've got. So that, that's what you've got to be able to sell. Wow. Okay. So yeah, you're a very busy trial lawyer, going to trial quite a bit. <laughs> How do you manage 
being a husband, a father, and just doing cases like this, which would I was saying would give me paranoia. Like especially, you know, we have children, so mm -hmm. you just you see a case that maybe a child's involved with. Like how how do you deal with like the whole family life and and just like managing work and family and everything? It's uh, it's something that I, you know, have to deal with on a daily basis. Um, but being with my family obviously brings me the most joy because I'm able to get away from the stress of the daily grind. Yeah. Um, but, you know, my time with my family is sacred to me. So, mm -hmm. you know, while I'm at home with my, my wife and my child, I try to just strictly focus on them because I know, like, work is always there no matter what. And you guys know no this. Matter what, yes. yeah. <laughs> when I go back to the office the next day, I'm going to have all the same stack of files. Sure. Um, but yes, I, I also take pride in knowing that when there's a case that involves a young child, or a family and we all can relate i like to at least think that i'm making a change in yes. a law in a policy in this overall safety because we want our children to be safe and their friends Correct. to be safe and their families to be safe so i like to always keep that in mind that at least if i can make a small difference to improve the safety so our children and everyone else is safe then you know i can't that's, ask for any more that's good that's no, something that then really to fight good. for no well i mean so when you're in trial um I guess the the biggest confusion for me because obviously I'm not a lawyer or anything like that. So, what is the defense? Uh, what are, what do the defense attorney? What is their job exactly? Uh, is it to obviously defend the the person who's at fault, right, or the insurer who's at fault? But how would you explain to to our audience what the defense attorney's job is? So, I mean, it's every case is different and also it depends on who do you have on the other side like what i mean by that is which defense lawyers there are some defense lawyers that you know i have a tremendous amount of respect for they're really good they don't play any games they know if you have a real injury case they're going to come to the table and they're going to talk serious numbers mm -hmm. there are other lawyers who are on the bottom of the you know mm -hmm. a list who are not as professional and like to do everything in the book or not in the book, I should say, everything dirty that's against the rule book. Mm. So the defense lawyer's purpose is, you know, they try to minimize the risk or the liability to their client if there's a chance that there is liability against their insured or client. So they're just trying to get out there and sell to the jury like, yeah, sure, maybe we're at fault <clears throat> or maybe we, yes, we are at fault, but the injuries to this person weren't necessarily caused by the accident. This person had, for example, pre-existing issues. So you can't believe everything this person and their experts are saying. So their job is to try to minimize the mm -hmm. risk if it's a case where they're disputing liability. But if it's a clean liability case, mm -hmm. sometimes they'll go out there, they'll admit the liability and say, yeah, we're responsible, sure. But the injuries that are being claimed here aren't really from this accident. And they'll, you know, if they have a history on the person, they'll go through and they'll get their experts up there and say, this person had pre-existing this, pre-existing that. So you can't really say the entire, the accident caused all of the injuries. Then you have some attorneys who are just really shady, who will just <laughs> do whatever it takes to, you know, um, discredit the plaintiff. Um, and that goes from surveilling them, watching what they're doing. If they see them out there shopping, um, carrying 10 grocery bags outside of a store, well, that's dangerous for my case because my client is claiming they're injured. And then right. this person, just caught them on video doing this activity shows they're not really injured you know so you really have to be aware of all of these things but to go back to your question the the main purpose is to minimize the risk mm -hmm. um, try to admit some sort of responsibility but claim the injuries weren't really caused by the accident right mm -hmm. so it varies I mean there's clear cases of liability <clears throat> and clear injury and they'll just say yeah we're at fault they probably won't let that case go to trial Right. Yeah. And then there's cases where they're disputing liability and saying we're just not at fault. That Those are the type of cases that are mostly hard fought where they're saying we're not at fault. Mm -hmm. We're not at fault. We didn't cause this. So therefore, if we didn't cause this, we didn't cause those injuries. Got That's it. when they're really... And I, I've been a part of those cases where I've gotten defensed. I've lost cases because, you know, um, there was a real legitimate dispute. Mm -hmm. Goes to the hands of the jury and the jury sides with the defense sometimes. That happens. But those are the most ones that they really fight hard in. but most of the time what you see is some sort of liability they'll admit to 
but it's always the nature and extent of the injuries they're disputing and saying, we don't think we're responsible for the surgeries, the injuries, so we want to minimize the risk. And the insurance companies, obviously, the less money they pay, the more they like that lawyer. So they're trying to not pay as much. Right. So if they're exposed less, they like that defense lawyer and they, they'll stay you know, with that defense lawyer and give them more cases. So Got it. Well, you just answered uh, <coughs> three, four, and five then. <laughs> I love it. We have all the that questions. Was, that, was, that was great. Yeah. I think that was, uh, that that was, was exactly the answer we were, uh, you know, looking for. Um, so regarding, um, I guess, any case, um, what do you see? What are, like, besides, I know you explained a little bit just now, but... What are like some of the things that you see uh, most uh, defense lawyers use before, um, maybe in your earlier uh, years, before you were doing litigation and going to trial and stuff like that? Like, what tactics did the defense or maybe adjusters use in order to, I don't know, like you said, minimize a case? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And this is something, you know, a lot of attorneys are aware of or should be aware of is once there's a claim open with an insurance company the first thing they do is they run a whole background on the claimant that the person claiming they're injured so they get a whole history of every single insurance claim the person has made and they'll be able to tell if that person's had a prior injury and of course they're going to share that with whatever attorney they hire so you have to be aware of that and the tact that's one of the first things they do also they'll search for your social media see if you have a social media page showing postings of you know, photos, doing something crazy that doesn't show you're injured. Right. And they'll of course send that to the attorney. So they're surveilling you, they're running background checks on you, they're following you sometimes. Um, they're really doing all these things to try to minimize and discredit you and claim either you're not really injured or your injuries are due to something else. Come or on. maybe it's just soft tissue. You're not really injured. You should resolve in four to six weeks, you know? Wow. So these are the things they do at the outset. And then once you get into litigation, an attorney gets involved, depending on that attorney. I mean, there's all sorts of tactics you know, they use. They can get an expert who they'll mm -hmm. pay, and that expert will say, yeah, your client's not really injured. They're faking, they're lying. They have a brain injury, for example. They're gonna hire a neuropsychologist who does an evaluation and says, Oh yeah, they're faking, they're malingering, they failed every validity examination, so therefore you can't believe them. Mm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's it's all about credibility though. What I said yeah. earlier is credibility is the only currency you have in the courtroom. And if you on the plaintiff side have more credible, more qualified experts, and you the attorney are credible, that's going to shine right through to the jury and your client, of course. Correct. So, and their people are not credible and you're able to discredit them, right. they're going to be able to see the difference. That's amazing. Wow, thanks for answering that. That was no, really good. No problem. That was perfect. I just I feel like I just went through like ten years of legal school. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there's more. I'm sure it. there's a lot more. Maybe there's more things I'm missing, but yeah. those are generally like the first, you know, things they're doing is once you open a claim, they're they're, they're yeah. Learning How many everything years about back of medical history can they go? I mean, generally in litigation, they're asking for like 10 years. Um, sometimes they'll ask for lifetime records, but you have to be aware of what they're trying to subpoena because the subpoena is in fine little print. You got to read it. And mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> sometimes they're asking for lifetime records. And if you miss that, they're going to get those records and they're going to pull everything up for right. your client. Okay. And, but most of the time, it's about 10 years. Sometimes you can get away with five years. So uh, did he just convince you to go to law school? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. We're changing careers, guys. Yeah, We're changing careers. <laughs> I'll go to medical school. But. Awesome. Okay, perfect. Well, I have another question. Um, I, I read the other day in, in an article online um, that both defense and plaintiff uh, lawyers use biomechanic experts. Mm -hmm. um, how would you use a biomechanic expert in one of your cases? So that's a good question too. Um, there's times where we have cases where it's a motor vehicle accident and the property damage on the vehicle is like minimal. Mm -hmm. You look at the photograph and you're like, well, the jury's gonna look at that and think what? There's no injury here, the, the, the hit is, looks like a tap. Right. But in these types of cases, a biomechanical engineer, just like a, a medical doctor, but the biomechanical is a good start to at least be able to explain the, the forces of an impact, how by their specialty, their engineering, they can explain, for example, somebody who's complaining of you know, a mild traumatic, mild traumatic brain injury, they can explain how the forces of a rear end or a side swipe or whatever mm -hmm. can cause the forces or the, the rotational the forces, physics. the physics, how that can cause 
someone's head to jerk back and forth or side to side and cause the brain to bounce off of the skull. So they're like the the, the, Mathematicians. the first hurdle kind of to <laughs> mm -hmm. explain just how you get to that injury. Or if you have a fracture in a vertebral body in your spine, they can explain like why a rollover accident can cause that. Just the forces, the rotational forces in the physics. Mm -hmm. Of course, then you get the doctors to really come in and explain the medical side and dig in deep. They're just like the first hurdle though to explain how this type of impact, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a car accident, it could be a slip and fall as well, where like a person slips, twists and torques their back, they can explain that too, how the twisting motion, the, the forces, the physics can cause this person's, you know, disc to herniate or an annular fissure to appear mm -hmm. on the disc or something like that, but they're the first hurdle. And then your medical doctors take over the rest and are able to explain. That's amazing. Um, in the same uh, in the same article that I was reading, uh, it said something about, uh, I guess, recon uh, mm -hmm. accidents. And what exactly is that? So accident reconstructionists and, and biomechanical engineers kind of go hand in hand. Okay. And the accident reconstructionists can piece together an accident, right? I mean, mm -hmm. yes, you have traffic collision reports from officers who are taking measurements and saying, oh, you know, this car ended up here, this car ended up here, and it's so far from this curb, it's so far from this curb. Yeah. You know, like that stuff, you look at it, I don't really comprehend it that well, mm -hmm. but an accident reconstruction takes all that and pieces the whole accident together. Sometimes without even having to go to the site, can just do it on a Google aerial map and look up the whole intersection mm -hmm. if Figure there's an accident mm -hmm. and piece it all together. So they're important because like like the biomechanical, they're using physics too to explain rotations, mm -hmm. um, distances of right. cars when, a, if for example, a car is making a left and cuts off another car's right of way, mm -hmm. they'll able, they'll, they're able to explain based on speeds, you know, how far a car was when they made that left, yeah. how they could have waited, how they could perceive and react. and all this different stuff Interesting, right? that really helps a jury understand why a party is at fault and why your client's not at fault for yeah. an accident. So, so for a general public, this is like CSI, private investigators, mm -hmm. it's gonna get all the yeah. forensics of how hard the brakes slammed yeah. and streak marks and everything. everything so. I'm sure. I mean, they look at the, like you said, they look at the, the skid marks to see if there's any braking. Mm -hmm. When do they start braking? They look at the EDR downloads from the cars just to look at speeds five seconds, four seconds leading up to the accident. Which all new cars do have black yeah. boxes. I think it's from what year and forward? I I don't remember. I, I don't know if it's like <laughs> 2010 on, I don't know if, I forget. Something something like that I heard, so every yeah. car has like a little box that collects information. Yeah. I think so. though, I'm not sure if they're able to collect the entire uh, information, but I think it's only like the first five seconds of- or It's the, about the first, it's the five seconds leading up to the to incident. The incident. Um, okay. And also tracks like seat belts were engaged, airbags deployed. Um, the ignition cycles, how many times the car has you know, been turned on. Um, and sometimes that's relevant because it goes hand in hand with the time of the accident or something. But really, it's the physics that they're able and the engineering that they can just piece together the whole accident mm -hmm. and explain why your client, or just in general, how an accident happened. Right. Because sometimes right. they're pretty complicated and you sure. really have to get somebody out there who can explain it to a jury to understand. The, the main question is what inspired you to become a lawyer? There you go. So my, I guess my drive was my dad, you know? My dad was always in business, uh, owned a lot of businesses and properties. So and you know, being, you know, he's not from America. He came to America with my mom in the seventies. He still wasn't really familiar with the laws, like, you know, what, how we do things here in the US, but he still made a hell of a lot out of himself. Mm -hmm. So when I grew up and I'm like, you know, he has all this stuff, he doesn't really fully comply or fully understand. I shouldn't say comply, but he doesn't really understand the nuances. Mm -hmm. I always thought to myself, it'd be good to somebody have someone in the family kind of look out for his interest. Right. So sure. that's what made me want to be a lawyer. But I wasn't sure really what I wanted to go into when I started. I was just doing all sorts of different stuff. Whatever I can. So you twisted from potentially business law into yeah, I'm glad I didn't PI. stick to business. Yeah, yeah. Because business law, I mean, I would have been more transactional in the office, doing paperwork. Right. You know, <laughs> not, I like I the voice with that. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, look, kudos to the lawyers who do it. Mike Lazowski. Yeah. <laughs> kudos to the lawyers who do it and yeah. have patience to do it. But yes. you know, I have fun in the courtroom. I have fun 
seeing, you know, uh, learning from one of the best, Gary Dordick, and, you know, it's just been a hell of a ride so far. Yeah, you, awesome. I've met Gary. I love Gary. He's, yeah, he's an awesome. He he's must really, be the coolest really cool person, person to work, work yeah. for. Yeah, no, I'm lucky. I'm lucky to have been able to land where I have, and the opportunities he's given us, um, you know, is something that I, I'll never forget. And just yeah. keep learning, keep marching, and try to expand and make it bigger. That's great. Wonderful. Are you excited for the new Dordic Trial College coming up in Mexico? Are I you am, attending? Of course. Have yes. to be there. This is very yes. exciting for um, attorneys <laughs> everywhere out there. Yeah. You have to look into Dordic Trial College. We went last year. It was, it was amazing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So. It's not only because it's Cabo, although that's a big deal. Oh, sure. Big reason to go. But there's really going to be some improvements, I think, this year with more advanced trial skills seminars. Um, a lot of really good lawyers, some of the top lawyers in the country and the state will be there, so it'll be fun. I well, guess I was going to ask, uh, so what I was actually going to ask you is how would you, um, what is your message for all the other attorneys who are maybe not handling trial uh, litigation and who handle more of like the pre-lit side? Um, I know that your firm works very close with a lot of them and teaching them the skills that you guys have learned. and and stuff like that. So what, what would you say to one if, if let's say one was here? You know, I was there too myself, so I know what it feels like to um, be under the gun sort of when you're having, you have a case, you have someone's life in your hand and you need to decide if you're gonna file a lawsuit, are you gonna hire experts, or are you gonna pay all the litigation costs? It gets costly, it gets expensive. And what my message would be to lawyers who are in that position is, we're a firm that likes to help. So we are a resource to you. And when I say that, I'm not just saying, send your case to us and sit on the sideline. No, our message is come join us, come get on the team with us, come to the deposition, do the discovery with us, watch the interviews with the clients, come sit with us in trial, argue the motions, let's write some motions together. So they learn too. So the next time, maybe we'll do another case together or not, even if we don't, they have the experience and they know how to do it because the most important thing is you want somebody who's fit and competent to handle someone's life. Yeah. Who, you know, they have their life in their hands. So you want to make sure that person knows what they're doing to help a family out, help a person out or whatever it is. So that's our message yeah. is come join us. Well, don't just sit on the sidelines yes yeah, so it'd be learning too so yeah, yeah. Be I, learning. Mean, I love that about you uh you guys and this whole industry that you that we're in um is that you know you guys can there's somebody out there that you can count on mm -hmm. you know in in marketing and advertising and and in any almost any other bit, uh, type of industry it's not like how pi is where you guys actually spend quality time with not only you know reviewing the case like you said and stuff like that i mean that's that's it's almost unheard of you know? yeah and you know that's the only way you're gonna pay it forward because when i was in that position you know i was a young attorney i didn't know what i was doing and i and i went and watched some of the greats and i started to kind of follow them around at cala at these events and watch their speeches watch their seminars and pay close attention to how they do things how do they work their cases what do they look for and now that I've been with, you know, Dornick's firm for five years, I have a great, I, a great sense of what, you know, to look for in these cases. So when I'm talking to other attorneys who maybe don't have an interest in doing trials, and some of them are like that, or some that are, but don't have the experience, I like to welcome them to just join yeah. and learn, because that's where it's all at. And are there some pointers on how to evaluate a case? I know Gary talks a lot about that uh, in, in Cabo and stuff like that. Is there, have you created maybe your own or, or do you use some of the methods that he uses? Um, yeah, I mean, I evaluate a case, you know, by looking at obviously the extent of, you know, I don't know, the, the, the damage to the, to the person, their harm, their injuries. Um, I like to look at, you know, uh, what's the other side's role in it? You know, how are they responsible? How are we going to prove, you know, liability? And all these different theories are just running to my. I don't have like a per se checklist, right? But you know, I like to look at the gravity of the harm. What's the likelihood of liability we're going to win? And you know, is there enough coverage and insurance on the other side that makes sense for an attorney to get involved? Because sometimes there's not. And if it's yeah. not, I'm honest with the client and say it's not worth it to bring an attorney on board to take part of your fee. Okay. So you know. Well, great. And besides, besides, I guess, Gary, do you have somebody that uh, that you look up to in the industry that, 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, um, I went to the Jerry Spence College in okay. August. Okay. So I spent three weeks there uh, learning a yeah. lot about stuff I never knew. Wow. Um, and, you know, one of my mentors, I would say there is Joey Lowe. Okay. Uh, Joseph Lowe, who some of you might know. I don't know, mm -hmm. some of you may not, but he's a disciple of Jerry Spence. And I got to talk to Jerry Spence there too. And I know it was his, his history. Um, so he's definitely somebody I look up to. Um, you know, in the practice of law, for sure. Wow, cool. Three weeks in Wyoming, too. That must yeah. have been really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's nice. It's You're on a ranch with no cell phone service, no wireless service. Your wife probably hated that. Yeah, you know, you have to drive, <laughs> you have to drive a couple miles every night to get some service and oh my God. call your family. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me ask you this, too. Uh, what what does a, an attorney have to do to get involved with you guys? Uh, who do they call? Um, you know, do they get a hold of you? Um, is that the best way? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I I know a lot of attorneys in the industry. I have great relationships with a lot of them. When they have questions or cases, they they call me. I always say, give me a call on my cell phone. I give my cell phone number. Um, so me, um, you know, there's other people in my office, and you guys know Alonzo at my office. He's uh, well known too, and knows a lot of people in the industry. So, you know, but I'm I'm more than happy to talk to people one on one with my cell phone, grab some coffee, get to know each other. You know great that's kind of how it goes that's all that's really cool yeah. yeah that's really cool are there any things you would want to say to say for instance students who are starting in law school right now are there any pointers yeah i mean inspiration quotes <laughs> anything that you would want to let them yeah, know about yeah i mean you know that, that's as i sit here and think about it um i can't help but think about my own experience because you know coming out of law school obviously they teach they kind of brainwash you when you're in law school what I mean by that is they just teach you to think black and white. They don't really teach you to deal with the realities of the world and in the law practice. That's something I really didn't know um, until a few years out. So I would say, you know, to law students is try to take advantage of every opportunity you get while in law school, whether you're going to be an intern or working for firms during the summer or clerking for judges. Take advantage of all of it and see what you really like. Like for me, the, the mistake I made was I just went to one firm. I stayed with that firm and I didn't really like it because I worked for them after and I told myself I should have tried other stuff too. Got it. But, Got it. you know, take advantage of every opportunity. Um, um, know that when to, once you graduate, you got to really uh, adapt. They brainwash you, you got to adapt to deal with the realities. Law school is not really that fun. Um, it's a lot of work, it's a lot, at least for me. It was a lot of challenge and work and it was something different for me. But um, you know, it, it's just align yourself with the right people. You know, ask questions to people who are smarter than you so you learn. Surround yourself with, you know, a lot of intelligent minds and lawyers that you, you follow or look up to. Um, ask questions. Like, uh, yeah. you can ask questions to Gary and he'll, he's as busy as he is, he will answer. Mm -hmm. Other guys in the industry are the same way. I mean, you know, you just got to do just it. ask yeah just do it yeah. absolutely awesome. don't hold it back yeah. you got to just ask i, yeah. I get that I, I think you answered every question this afternoon amazingly <laughs> yes we got a lot of answers we'll have links below everything with the questions that we asked today so if you want to scroll back on the video with certain questions al did an amazing job of answering them absolutely and if you guys uh have any questions for al uh you can either reach us uh by emailing us uh, at business at doctors for accidents dot com or um, we'll link everything below. Yes. Or you can leave a comment below and we'll make sure to get the message out to Al so that he can get in touch with you guys. Um, other than right. that, thank you for watching, thank guys. I hope that you guys learned something today. And uh, this is Jean Paul with Personal Injury Show and my co-host, Nicole. Don't forget to like, share and follow. Thanks, guys. Take Bye. care.